Hey, what's up, you guys? This is Keith St. John, and you are listening to GlamMetal.com. Welcome to the Glam Metal Interview Series, presented by RockMusicStar.com, with host Thomas S. Orwatt Jr. Hey, Glam Metal Heads, it's Thomas from Rock Music Star with episode number eight of the Glam Metal Interview Series. It's August 21st, 2020, and I just completed an interview with Kingdom Come vocalist Keith St. John. During this interview, we discussed the passing of rock legend and Quiet Riot drummer Frankie Benelli, whose death was announced earlier during the day. Also, Keith discussed his current bands, Kingdom Come and Burning Rain, and his time front in Montrose from 1998 to 2012. So here he is, Keith St. John. Hey everybody, we have a special guest on the phone today. We have Keith St. John from Kingdom Come. I'm on the phone with us. Hey, what's up? Keith, how are you doing today? Uh, it's been a rough day, man. Uh, as you know, uh, today was the day uh, they, they announced uh, uh, Frankie Benali passing. So uh, it's been a little bit crazy and stressful because, you know, I'm a lot of my friends are mutual friends, and it's just a tight web of musicians out here in L.A. that all know each other, and it's it's kind of a tough day, man. It's close to home. Yeah, now you uh, actually played with Frankie and Quiet Riot um, for a while. Uh, what was that experience like for you? Um, well, I didn't play with them that long. It was a brief experience because uh, I, I kind of agreed or uh, at least talked about kind of that uh, on a permanent basis the position of singing with quiet riot really wasn't going to be the right fit for me at that particular time anyway uh you know i was you know you go through different uh periods as an artist and i was definitely developing more of my own thing at that time and, and didn't feel it was a really the right time to uh to go in and, and try to be the uh, front man for such an iconic band that has such a specific sound and a specific front man. So, um, yeah, it was all good. You know, I went in and did some shows, uh, while they were looking for a new singer and those shows were great. They were a lot of fun. And ever since those shows, I stayed really good friends with Frankie and we did other work together. We, we jammed on different things, uh, uh, on certain events. And, you know, I talked to Frankie, you know, a few times, I don't know, sometimes a lot, sometimes not that much per year, but um, he was always really super cool to me and a complete gentleman. And we uh, actually had a lot in common, uh, you know, with some of his uh, hobby things that he liked. You know, he was really into the ancient uh, Japanese history, and, and I was as well. So we, we shared some uh, some common interest on that. And, uh, you know, spent a little bit of time talking and, and, uh, you know, he showed me a, a lot of his items he had and some really excellent collections, um, that, you know, most people who know him and were close to him know about. Yeah. So, uh, I, I had a little bit more of a personal experience with him, I think, than a professional one. Um, but I know he did, uh, he did mention me in the movie that, uh, that he did, uh, a couple of years ago. And, uh, actually it's a funny story cause I, I didn't know I was in it, uh, until we were, we were about to walk in from the lobby when the, when the red lights started going and we had to, we had to walk into the screening and Frankie turns to me and goes, Oh, Hey Keith, by the way, Hey, you're in it. I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> and, uh, <I'm> like, <laughs> so it was, it was cool. I mean, it was fun. Um, I, I was grateful, you know, that he uh, gave me a little tiny tip of the hat. And um, and uh, I, I was really grateful to be just a small part of uh, of, of his circle. Yeah. And uh, we'll miss him greatly, man. He's, he's well loved. Did you ever regret leaving Quiet Riot? No, I didn't. Because at the time, I, I had, you know, more and more work coming in. And I was able to stretch out kind of my own style of things and um there, there are other bands that i got into which were just a little bit more of a natural fit that just uh allowed me just to do my own thing kind of the way i do it 
mm-hmm. and not have to do another singer's kind of isms, as I call them, you know, to do Kevin DeBro isms isn't so natural for me. Um, you know, and I think by and large, what the promoters really wanted at a quiet ride, especially since there's such a surge of that generation of music coming back from the eighties and, you know, people are remembering the MTV videos. And of course, Quiet Riot was one of the first bands, if not the first band to break through and, um, and get heavy metal out there on the, uh, on the MTV scene, like in a big way. Yeah. They uh, into did. the media and, and Kevin's look and Kevin's sound is just, it's so specific that if, if you don't have, that specific quality to your voice, um, I, I don't think promoters would be buying it. I, I just, I, I don't regret it. No, no, I, I don't feel like uh, that really would have been the right position for me. And, um, you know, I, I'm, pre- I'm pretty happy with that decision, yeah. Well, Keith, you certainly fit in with your current band, Kingdom Come. What led to you joining the band? And tell us about the upcoming Kingdom Come streaming concert event coming up on September 5th. There is, there is. Um, well, let me just say that, you know, Kingdom Come was out of the loop with these original members from 1988 and 89 for about 30 years. And um, the singer, Lenny Wolf, the original singer, he kept a version of it going, uh, I think mostly over in Europe. And... Uh, without any of the original, the other original guys for some years. And then he had retired right around the same time or just a few years before, uh, James Kotek and the other original members decided they wanted to get back together. And so, uh, they asked him if he wanted to come back out. And, you know, he, uh, you know, he just respectfully said he was retired and, and, uh, he had kind of hung it up for Kingdom Come, and with his blessing, they continued, and um, they asked me if I would come along uh, for the 30th anniversary tour, so I did, and we got started with that, and, you know, it's a, it, it's a real fit for me because of their influences, you know, uh, I believe Lenny Wolf's influences, they have to be kind of the same ones I have. And I can kind of do my thing with the songs. And I I think it still pays a good tribute to the way he sang them and the way fans want to hear it, Um, which is kind of what I was talking about earlier and trying to pick the right fit. But fast forward to now, we we had just signed up with Sullivan Vig, a big-time agency, which is the right kind of agent for this kind of band. And this year, 2020, was really going to be our breakout year. This is the year he planned to insert us into all kinds of bigger festival shows. Um, we had a gig alongside Guns N' Roses over at Sweden Rock and all kinds of gigs at that level this year. And so I think, you know, for the guys in this band, it was a little bit disappointing that things happened the way they did with COVID and the timing. Um as far as this concert comes, uh, that's coming up in September, this is going to be the one sort of fill in gig of the year, getting the band together to do this because we're on opposite sides of the country. Uh, one guy is in Florida, one guy is in Pennsylvania, and the rest of us are out here in the LA area. So, you know, it's not easy with this isolation and this pandemic for us to get together and do anything. You know, even when they do start opening things up, I think, you know, we'll take a little bit longer before we go out and get together again. So this really is a big experience for us as far as the planning that we had to do to get everybody together. And since we're incurring a little bit more expenses to do it, we, uh, you know, we're putting it out there as a pay-per-view concert and hopefully the $12 ticket price won't be inhibiting for people. It still is a pretty cheap price to go out and see a real rock concert or stay in and see a real rock concert as the case may be. So 
Uh, yeah, we're trying to pull out all the stops. The VIP Kingdom experience comes with a whole bunch of stuff. And I don't know if we can list it somewhere online, but it's a, it's a mouthful to say it all. Um, but one of the things you can win with the VIP experience is a Kingdom Come signed guitar from Gibson Epiphone. And, uh, you're going to get a signed poster. You're going to get, uh, an event custom t-shirt custom button, a behind-the-scenes video, a uh, Zoom meet-and-greet with the band, uh, just about everything. I'm sure I'm leaving some stuff out. Uh, it's a whole kitchen sink VIP experience. Yeah, I think it's a, a very innovative idea considering everything that's going on. And, um, you know, I, I personally don't have any problem paying like, you know, $10, 12 $15 to watch a, a live stream. I mean, people are just starved for music. I mean... I think it's really, I think it's cool, and I've I've watched some, and I've I've liked I liked what I've seen. You know, it's it it is, it is what it is, and it's you know if you want to see live rock, you know these days that's what you have to do, and uh, I I highly endorse it, and I I think everybody should definitely check off the band on September fifth. Yeah, and it's really easy to sign up and and get a ticket ahead of time and get a code. For people who have never done it, it seems maybe a little bit mysterious. You know, they've probably heard of the sports pay-per-view stuff and maybe never really tried it, but it's a piece of cake. The payment deal is really secure. They give you the code, and it's a no-brainer. It's really secure. And um, for those people out there wondering, um, you can't share your code. <laughs> if one code is entered twice, then then that code just completely gets pumped out of the system. So they have their, uh, they have their ways of working that. But, uh, you know, we're really lucky that the owner of Monsters of Rock, uh, Cruz, is hooked up with these different online pay-per-view uh, distributors and could arrange this so well. Yeah. Um, here's a guy who's been in the business, you know, since the early 80s managing and he's been an agent I and mean, he's had so many uh higher up positions in the sort of 80s hair metal band world and he's been doing business for so long that he's just you know he's a really really smart guy and we're, we're really lucky to have him behind us setting this up for us yeah now is this going to be a full 90 minute set uh somewhere thereabouts they wanted a little bit shorter than that, so we're planning on a 75, but the last two live streams I did with them went pretty far over, and everybody was okay with it, so yeah, somewhere between a 75 and a 90. Are you, are you playing the, uh, the first Kingdom Come record that was recorded in 1988? Are you playing that in its entirety still? There may be some songs on that record missing, because we're also playing the second record, songs from both of those records, because um, these four magnificent gentlemen uh, played uh, both of those records, the 1988 and the 1989 record, In Your Face. Right. And uh, another thing that, <laughs> I don't know if this is still a surprise, I think I mentioned it a couple times on the net, but we are planning to debut a little bit of new material that we've been jamming. Awesome. So uh, we're, we're in the midst of working it up right now. I'm actually going over Rick Stires tomorrow to see if we can wrap up a couple of these tunes and uh, put a bow on them for the uh, for September. Because, you know, me personally, I always like to play stuff forward and give the audience something new, give the fans something they haven't heard yet. And like I was saying, this concert that we play will not be repeated anywhere online or available anywhere other than the pay-per-view on the fifth so wow, that's good to know you know I, I i think having the new music on there is is a nice bonus for fans that are willing to say hey man you know let me just spend a couple of dollars to come and see these guys one of my favorite bands yeah that leads me to the next question uh do you got are you guys planning on putting out um a record anytime soon It's still up in the air. Uh, there is uncertainty with uh, what the legalities are with this lineup uh, right now and everything being 
where it is without signing any new contracts or agreements with us releasing something under the name Kingdom Come. Now, of course, we could call the band something else and release anything we want as a band, but uh, uh, I believe, uh, you know, we're still in negotiations with Lenny Wolf to sign off on releasing another Kingdom Come record, and I'm not sure exactly where that's at right now I because see. we haven't really been talking about it since the COVID thing uh, started. Uh-huh. All right. Uh, the so, net, well, I'm, I'm sorry. The short answer is we have songs and we want to put them out. And when it's, when it's legally the right time to do it, we will. Keith, I'd also like to discuss one of the other bands that you're in, Burning Rain. This band also features our current Dead Daisies guitarist, Doug Ulrich. Um, you released a great record on March 22nd, 2019 called Face the Music. You must be pretty happy with the way that it came out. This really should have been a chart top and album. Yeah, well, yeah, I was real happy with the way that record came out. I don't know if you've heard any of the other Burning Rain material. That Face the Music album was our fourth record to date. And the turn that it took was... We really simplified songs, simplified arrangements, simplified lyrical content, and just tried to get a little bit more basic. And I think sometimes when you do it, you you do that, you do wind up appealing to a wider audience. And um, I feel like initially that record got really great attention in the press and a nice push. But... Our issue is probably Doug and my time in maintaining the live band and staying together and going out and supporting the record for a long enough period of time. Yeah. We did shows in 2019. Um, We did, Doug and I did a little acoustic promotional tour around Europe right after the release, and the band played some shows too both in the States and in Europe. But uh, I feel like when you're not out there supporting it and playing live for at least a good solid year that the, uh, you know, the support and the, uh, and the buzz about it can fizzle. So, and, and Doug has been busy with the dead daisies, which is, I think they just did their second record in 2020. They've spent some time in 2020 um, putting some albums in the can, and that's been a lot of work for him. Mm-hmm. So I haven't really been able to get uh, much time out of him in 2020 other than the uh, Monsters of Rock Cruise uh, shows that we did. So we'll see. I- I'm hoping that we can come back and support it more. Yeah. It's- uh, right now that's going to be a little bit more dependent on the Dead Daisies uh yeah, touring schedule, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe something could be worked out where you you can, um, you know, play with the Dead Daisies. You know, you can have uh, Doug can play uh, two two sets, and it would it would be friggin' amazing. We were talking about that, uh, you know, last time the Daisies were out, and we had this band together with the, our new rhythm section, which is Blas Elias, uh, who you know from Slaughter and Brad Lang from Y and T. Uh, when the Daisies were still playing and we were working on the last record, we were kind of already talking about that. So I don't know if it's still a possibility. That would work out great uh, for us, for Burning Rain, if that could be done. So, you know, uh, more information as it comes along on that. Unfortunately, I, I don't really have a, a solid answer on that yet. But to answer your first question, yeah, I, I love the way that record came out. Keith, another cool project that you're involved in is Rock and Roll Face Mask, which is a company that sells organic face coverings. What led to you getting involved in this business? Well, uh, my partner was was wanting to start a custom clothing company. And I, you know, I started hooking her up. She made me some stuff. And then she was telling me, you know, she wanted to start branching out and start a website and start a company. And so I, you know, being in the circle I'm in with all the sort of rock stars that are buddies of mine and people I've worked with over the years, I said, well, 
why don't I just hook you up with a bunch of people that can, you know, get your stuff out there on big stages and you can have these great rock star pictures of your custom stuff, um, you know, right away to, to like just get your brand off the ground. And so we started doing that. I started helping her with that and things started to kind of work out pretty quickly. And then all of a sudden this COVID thing came around and, you know, I, we were kind of hanging out together and we were talking about, you know, what they had done in China and what was going on over there with the face masks and stuff. Cause she's Chinese. So, you know, she's talking to the people in China about this whole thing before it ever came over to the States. And we just said, Hey, you know, we've got all this fabric laying around. What would you think about us just making some masks for us and our friends? By the time this thing hits, you know, we'll have some masks laying around. And, you know, her mom, uh, you know, had experience in, uh, in custom clothing and, and sewing and stuff over in China. And she said, man, you really need to use organic cotton. And, you know, the other people aren't doing it with any of their masks, but that's the stuff that needs to be on your face and you should be breathing all day long and all these other safety features that she, she came up with that other people weren't using yet in China. So we grabbed some cool rock and roll looking patterns. We got the stuff printed on organic cotton fabrics, which nobody else was doing at the time and still not a lot of them are doing. And as soon as we advertised that we were selling them, they just, it exploded. It just, we just had a lot of orders right away. Wow. And, uh, rock and roll face masks was born. Yeah, no, it, it's a good idea. I always wondered that when everyone started wearing face masks, it's like, what are we putting on our face? I mean, I mean, how do, how do we know this isn't filled with chemicals and that? I mean, you know, it's, and it's back. Well, a lot of it that, is. Yeah. Is yeah. That, you know, acetates and, Anything that has any stretch to it, um, and, and PVC is another material that's in a lot of these uh, fabrics, and it's got it's treated with thousands of chemicals, literally. And for people who've got to work all day and wear these masks and breathe through that all day, it's I, I find that to be really unhealthy. Yeah. And you know, I'm a rock and roll dude, and and I'm a blood and guts guy, but on the other side, you know, as of gotten into midlife or whatever you want to call it um you know i've replaced a lot of my essential things like the sheets i sleep on and pillowcases and you know your underwear and stuff that's going to be close to your private parts with all organic cotton because i've read about the evils of not doing that and you know so this thing was just right in sync with my thinking and you know my whole sort of clique of people who already knew me for that just right away said, oh, we, we got to buy case masks because blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, my partner came up with the name. It was so simple. Why don't you just, I was thinking of all these crazy names. He goes, why don't you just call it rock and roll face mask? And we'll just, <laughs> I was like, done. So yeah, www.rockandrollfacemasks.com. Head there and, uh, you know, we'll take care of you, man. They're, they're the healthiest, well, one of the healthiest masks out there. And also, we got a lot of rock fashion going on. Excellent. Um, I I want to um, also talk uh, a little bit about your time in uh, Montrose. You play there, played with Ronnie Montrose from 1998 to 2012. Um, what what were some of the highlights of playing with a legend like him? Gosh, man, Ronnie himself is one of those you know just pure artists that, you know, you get the impression that certain people like Dylan and, you know, Crosby, you know, they just don't give a shit what the media says about anything. They're going to be themselves. They're going to make their art the way they want, and they're not going to follow any path. And that's kind of the way Ronnie was. And uh, he was a master of his craft. So everything that rubbed off of him, just brought me to a higher level on a, on, on a lot of areas, you know, how I managed my music business, how I managed my life, my, my personal affairs, and definitely, you know, how I approached um, how much effort I was going to put into singing the songs and getting them right. 
And, uh, you know, he coached me on a lot of stuff. So, I mean, just being around him for all those years is an amazing life highlight. As far as things we did together, um, we played the Woodstock 40th up in uh, Golden Gate Park. It was about 75,000 people. Wow. And we had a, we had a slot right after the Steve Miller band. And it was about four in the afternoon. It was a great spot. The sun was not in our eyes. <laughs> it was, it was a really nice spot. And I said to him while we were in rehearsal, I said, Hey, Ronnie, we, we got this great drummer in the band right now. At the time, it was, uh, Wild Nick Brown from Dawkin. Oh, yeah, it was right. an amazing, amazing, fantastic drummer akin to nobody's John Bonham, but you know, Wild Mick really comes close to, to that level of drummer and a really amazing drummer. So I said, we got Wild Mick in here. Why don't we kick in with a Who tune or something? Let's just do my generation and open the set with that. And I got to say, when we came out in front of that crowd and opened with that tune, the, I mean, all the Montrose tunes went great. And the crowd was waiting for those Montrose tunes, but they didn't expect that. And when we hit that, the level of energy and how nuts everybody went just basically if you were on that stage it just swept you off your feet wow. and um uh another thing that happened that day uh neil sean was on standing on the deck with us when we played that set and somebody came and whispered in my ear and asked me if neil could have my number which uh I, you know i did a little stint with neil after that uh you know a couple months after that we put something together too and I got to meet all kinds of, you know, other people in the food chain uh, from the Bay Area, from the, you know, the old school rock star music scene. And uh, so, I mean, the thing about Ronnie, about working with Ronnie is it, it did open doors. I kind of jumped over the fence to the other side and came in the back door because so many, so many guys that I admire, um, especially guitar players, grew up as fans of Ronnie. So, you know, it kind of gave me this, this automatic, you know, automatically I was a guy to call, you know, cause I was playing with Ronnie now. Yeah. So, you know, there's a long list of, you know, especially West coast guitar players who grow, grew up listening to Ronnie's music who, you know, who started calling. Me. Right. So, you know, just the whole package was, was an amazing experience. Yeah. It was, it was such a tragic end to his life. I, I mean, he didn't seem like the type of person that would do that, but then again, who does, right? I mean, that must have been come, come as a real shock to you. Absolutely. Uh, it was hard to believe. There was a lot of distance between everybody who was close to him for a while. I think because nobody wanted to believe that's what really happened that he just, he just sat down and took his own life. But given his history and, you know, some other things we found out about him, you know, with depression he was going through and apparently, um, you know, 15 years before that, he, unbeknownst to me and a lot of other people, he had tried to take his own life one time before. Oh, wow. So, you know, he just... You know, he was an old school man's man and whatever sensitivities he had that, you know, maybe needed to be addressed or should have been talked about. And, um, you know, whatever kind of a psychological therapy or something could have opened him up. It's a shame that he didn't get it. Yeah. Because he was, he was a tough one to lose, man. He was like, Ronnie was like everybody's dad. No matter who was at the table, no matter where we were on tour, no matter who was backstage. Ronnie was at the head of the table and, you know, he just, he had that, uh, he had that magical aura that, uh, that just sort of made him the head of the table guy at all times. And it was, it was really tough when, when he went, you know, cause when you're like that, most of the things you belong to and most of the circles you run with, are used to you calling all the shots and kind of being the leader, you know, when the leader's gone, you know, everything just kind of falls apart. So, so, uh, yeah, man, that's a tough one, man. That's, that's a hard one to get over. 
Yeah, uh, especially when you work with someone that long, uh, as long as I knew him, and as many things as he was involved in in my life, you know, just kind of really had to take some time off for a couple of years and then start over. Yeah, yeah, I, I can imagine. Well, I mean, rock and roll can have is like uh, great highs, but also some pretty, pretty uh, nasty lows too. Yeah, man, but there, but I'll tell you, there is nothing else like the feeling of an audience that comes together and just gets that whole electricity going in between them and the band and, you know, back and forth. There, there's nothing else like that. And all the musicians out there listening to this know exactly what I mean. Yeah. So, you know, even though there's some lows and, you know, there's some roller coasters and different times when you're in rock and roll, I wouldn't trade it for anything else in the world. Yeah. Well, I, I think I think the audience uh, feels the same way. I mean, there's nothing like seeing a live band. You know, when you see a great live band and you're in the audience and, you know, you have that those couple beers in you, I mean, there's nothing better in the world. No way, man. Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah. And there's a certain moments, every performer probably has those half a dozen moments that something happened that was just lifted them out of the room that they'll never forget. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's uh, end the interview uh, on the f f uh, question of uh, what would you consider to be the highlight of your career so far? It's tough to say, man. I don't I don't know that there's one highlight. Um, everything has had its road, and the very beginning was great which was, you know, just a, a couple of different record deals with, with projects that, you know, maybe didn't work out or, you know, worked out to a certain level, but then broke up and I moved on. I mean, none of those experiences are small for me. You know, all of the ride was, was really full, I can say. And, um, you know, that, that moment, some of the moments at the big shows, that moment I just described at Golden Gate Park was a great one. Um, I was singing with Lynch Mom on a bunch of different tours, and um, we did Loud Park at the Seidama Super Arena in Tokyo. And, um, you know, that gig's about a 36,000 seater, which is about twice the size of Staples Center in Los Angeles. So, that was a great moment. Wow. I... Um, but writing my own material for me, for Keith St. John, me being in the studio and hearing something come out of the speakers, that's what I envisioned in my head, and maybe even better as I'm developing it. For me, um, as a guy who just loves to write and create and record, those are probably my highlights. You know, just somewhere in the studio writing with so-and-so and, -so and recording such-and-such. -and, and I guess I'm kind of a hippie that way. Um, you know, some of those moments, you know, they lead to something lucrative. And some of them, um, they just created another part of another body of work that I really love and, and respect. And... uh like I said, having a kind of hippie mentality, you know, some of the biggest moments for me don't involve, you know, a big career move. But, um, uh, you know, there was that first time burning rain back in 99, went over to Japan and I had never been before. And the fans of American rock metal bands in Japan at that point kind of treated them like the Beatles when the Beatles first came to America. You know, they they stood in lines on the other side of the turnstiles waiting for you to come through the airport and camp out of your hotel and um, you didn't know it, but you know, there was 50 of them just sort of in the restaurant where you were going to eat lunch and, and then you know, all of a sudden they all got up and you realize that all these people are here for you guys. So, you know, there's 
all kinds of little tidbits along the way, and I can't really say that there's any particular standouts because I'm uh, I'm always moving forward. And speaking of which, you know, I've got a St. John record in the can right now, which hopefully we'll get it out um, when the timing looks right. I'm kind of looking at what's going on with the COVID and kind of trying to feel my way through that because I'm not used to putting any uh, putting a record out without being able to support it, go out with a band and support it live. So I'm just kind of waiting right now. Mm-hmm. I suppose if the COVID goes on long enough and it's going to literally be years, then um, then maybe the St. John record's going to come out. But I'm really proud of what this record's going to sound like when it comes out. It's a long time coming. It's been a long time since I put a put out a Keith St. John uh anything yeah it's gonna be awesome yeah so i'm looking forward to that um right now currently i'm working with a guy from holland named ron coolen he's released a few singles um i i recorded and wrote six or seven of the songs on his his record that he put together uh you can check that out uh there's a couple more things that i guess uh, if you Go to my uh, social media in the up and coming months that you'll see some other records coming out that I'm pretty proud of. Some of the stuff that I co wrote and sang on those. And uh, those will all be highlights as well. Awesome. I'm sure they will be, Keith. I'm sure there will be. Right on, Tom. All right. Well, I just want to thank you for your time, Keith. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this uh, Kingdom Come show. Uh, on September 5th. I'll definitely be one of the viewers. And um, we'll definitely talk to you again soon. I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you, my brother. I really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, come on down and come and get it all with King of Strong, September 5th at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern and 2 p.m. Pacific. And it's going to be one of the best shows the band's done since I've been in it because everybody is so excited to put this together. So... Hopefully we'll see some of you guys there. And Thomas, uh, thanks again, man. I look forward to talking again. All right, Keith. You take it easy. All right, brother. You too. Okay. See you. Cheers. Bye. And that concludes our interview with Keith St. John. For more on Keith St. John, please visit www.keithstjohn. For more of our Glam Metal interview series interviews, please visit glammetal.com or rockmusicstar.com. A special thanks to Eric Rodner for providing our awesome theme music.